Welcome everyone to the pro seminar of our Thus Spoke Nietzsche course. After seven weeks of lectures and seven weeks of seminars, it's now the time for the students to present their talks. I'm very much looking forward to them. The abstracts look very good. The first one is Javier Rivera. Take the stage, Javier. Right. Um, okay, so where do I begin? Um, so the abstract that I wrote here is has, an, has a Heideggerian uh, influence here. Um, the whole point is to trace Nietzsche's thought and what it will unravel. In Zarathustra, Nietzsche writes, Letcher will say, the overman shall be the meaning of the earth. I once made the assertion that Nietzsche does believe in meaning. However, I will not be making that assertion today. Um, the, the way to go about this is to begin, how do we question what does meaning mean? What does the earth mean? Sort of addressing the obvious, right? So in this case, what is the most unquestioned is what we will be pursuing here. So I must make it clear that what I'm attempting here is not a systematic approach, but rather a pointing to in the light of Islamic thought. The objection to this uh, may be said that this would fail to reach Nietzsche's thinking itself, that this would be the very prejudice of religion that Nietzsche wished to be free of, but this objection is also a prejudice against man himself, where one has presupposed a conventional understanding of the definition of religion as a simple moral hypothesis, uh, a mask to the will of deception. However, this kind of objection is also to deception. If we're gonna tackle religion seriously, we should see the historicity of religion um, where Iqbal defines religion as the expression of man. I think if we pursue this definition, religion as the expression of man, then we are completely open to using Islamic thought and engaging what Nietzsche could possibly mean. So the sooner we see religion as an expression of man, an expression of Dasein, an expression of being itself, the sooner we understand what Nietzsche meant by his magnum opus to go beyond good and evil. Alama Iqbal has forever intimated that Nietzsche was a product of a mystical experience that drove the depths of his very being. However, despite his own admiration for Nietzsche, he also felt a great remorse for not being able to meet him for Iqbal knew that Nietzsche was in desperate need of a spiritual teacher. I believe this assertion should be taken seriously from Iqbal in close study of Nietzsche's fall to his own madness and the coming end of his life. Therefore, this interpretation under Islamic mystical thought should be received simply as a mode of being, another expression amongst many expressions of being. If we proceed under the supposition that what Nietzsche experienced when writing Zarathustra um, was indeed a mystical one, then I think this mystical character, right, looking, this is where we begin, essentially, right? The mystical character is where we begin. He wrote Zarathustra through inspiration, right? A mystical, of mystical character. So I think this is the privileged witness right, the privileged beginning that we can start with, right? It's not just looking at um, what Nietzsche said, but where it began, what provoked him to write Zarathustra in the first place, but what made him write it in like a couple of days, basically, right? At least portions of it. A character of which one has had such experiences in contrary to those that have not. If we are truly to make a path towards Nietzsche's thinking itself, this mystical character should be realized as the dimension of which it originates. This is the mood that we must enter. Therefore, I believe Ibn Arabi is this privileged um, 
witness that we should have a comparison or trace his thought to. He is known in the Islamic world as the great sheikh, the great teacher. He is no stranger to mystical experiences. Um, I think having this parallel who someone has mystical experiences in comparison to everybody else that hasn't had mystical experiences. I think we can then begin to kind of dig into where Nietzsche was maybe going. For, you know, Ibn Arabi also wrote works um, within a few days of inspiration. So there is some pragmatic uh, parallels when someone has a great inspiration, a great mystical experience. So now that we've established the dimension of which we'll proceed, um, what then is meaning? Um, in etymology, if you break it down, it, the noun can be meninge, meninge as, as sense, right? Meaning can be sense. Um, so if we go back to the sentence, if the overman shall be the sense of the earth, then what is to be sensed? Um, but I, I think even starting off this is kind of getting us a little lost here. Maybe we should begin with what is, what is earth, right? If you break down earth, we can talk about land, mass, you know, a habitat, a planet. But if we use the definition abode of man, this can open up avenues for us to further explore. In light of Ibn Arabi's thinking, man is a, represent uh, is a representative of earth. But when man is represented in this way, man is female. Therefore, earth now carries a feminine characteristic. Terms such as mother nature now seem to carry a deeper historical significance in the psyche of human thought. If man is female in the context of earth, um, then we can freely translate abode of man as the dwelling place of woman. But I guess the, what I'm trying to say is if we take abode of man on a more micro scale, right, then the, the woman, right, it has the womb in which gives birth. So this is how I'm kind of correlating that uh, the earth has a feminine characteristic. So if we use this sense, right, uh, I want to put earth as a combination of man and woman into saying it's being itself. So in this, if we use meaning as sense, it can be the only way expressed is amor fati. Amor fati is the sense in which the overman should express the meaning of being itself. However, um, they, and again, what is, what, is, what is love to bring to this? Um, is the overman specifically an individual? It seems to be that the overman is a bridge, right? A bridge into being itself, which utilizes amor fati. And if we look at love as a movement, then the overman is simply one that goes with this movement, realizes the being itself. As Nietzsche once quoted, where one can no longer love, there one should pass by. So this is an essence, a movement, right? The overman is the one who realizes the movement of love itself. I mean, that's, I have like a minute or so left, uh, but th this is what beyond, uh, this is what the overman shall be the meaning of the earth would uh, entail here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Javi. Very good. Come back to that. Okay, Daniel. So welcome to my talk. I'll just go and start. When Nietzsche uttered his famous dictum, God is dead, 
he had seen not just the death of God, but the death of all things. The fundamental ground in which things could anchor themselves has been nullified. The abyss has opened up, leaving things in a transitory fleetingness within a void-like nihility. Accordingly, metaphysics, religion, and morality have become nullified too. Life has become fundamentally boring, dull, langweilig in German. Kierkegaard describes boredom as a demonic pantheism, quote, pantheism ordinarily implies the quality of fullness. With boredom, it is the reverse. It is built upon emptiness, but for this very reason, it is a pantheistic qualification. Boredom rests upon the nothing that interlaces existence. Its dizziness is infinite, like that which comes from looking down into a bottomless abyss. The pantheistic nihilization we are talking about here is hollowing all things out, yet in a very thorough, demonic manner. It is total in that sense. Kierkegaard continues that the Exzentrische Zerstreuung, or peripheral dissipation, an extraordinary scattering of the mind, is based upon boredom, is seen also in the fact that the diversion sounds without resonance, simply because in nothing there is not even enough to make an echo possible. Why does the madman proclaim his message at the marketplace? Because it is precisely there where we can hear the sounds of the new God. Because it is there where we can witness of the centering, dissipating images that keep us in a state of epidermal distraction. The churches have become tombs of God. The echoes of God have stopped resonating. The marketplace is also just like the harbor in Atlantis, the place that never rests. It is the place where the transitory fleetingness, which is driven by the abyssal nihility, presences itself in the most thorough manner, causing people and things to flow around as if they were in a dizzy rush. Because our age lacks all otium, we do not gather at sites of Skole anymore, but rather crowd into the marketplace or the mall when we have nothing to do. Yet the madman realizes how the people on the marketplace don't understand what he's saying. The tidings of nihilization are still on the way. The madman is too early. In fact, it may take another 50 or 100 years, who knows? until they may reach us, until the history of the next 200 years as the upcoming of nihilism, as Nietzsche prophesied, has finally re realized itself. Now, it is important for us to realize how boredom is essentially a problem of temporality. The German equivalent Langeweile literally means long while. Time itself has become a question mark, indeed so much so that the demon of boredom wants to do away with it, kill it. And if we are very cynical about modern culture, we could even say that the demon has turned into a whole economy that manages our desires and our boredom by killing time thoroughly. Both boredom and anxiety as symptoms of the dizziness of the infinite indicate a kind of orientationless, orientationlessness that has arisen in the new era. Boredom is a doing away with time, and anxiety is the feeling that we are burdened with the freedom that time grants us, while our existence is simultaneously fleeting and transitory. We are now used to think with our clock. We manage time. We try to control and contain time, in order to keep boredom and anxiety in check. People live in a weird rush without appreciation for the gifts of time. The structures of temporality that used to anchor us have been cracked open by the nihilization and swallowed up by the infinite. 
the movements of nihilization, so the perpetual cracking up, decentering, scattering apart and isolating at the non-ground, these movements are still going on, hollowing out the world thoroughly. I think that it was only within such a desperate and untimely or non-timely situation that Nietzsche had his vision of a world time as the eternal recurrence of the like. This vision is essentially a ring-like time. Instead of being merely stretched out linearly into infinity, time bends like a ring, wanders into the eternity of past and future, and then comes back rectilinearly to itself and ecstatically arises right beneath the present moment where past and future rejoin. The groundless time of modernity is transformed into a time that anchors itself into the home, in, in the home ground of the present moment. In this way, the actuality of time, which can never be fully realized within the demonic pantheism of boredom, can be restored again. Here, both past and future can be affirmed within the present as its constitutive element. This new weight of the actuality of time, however, feels like a burden, like the heaviest weight. It calls for a decision towards an existence in accordance with one's likeness that emerges on such a field. This true likeness can be captured best by a child that has immersed itself deeply in play. It is here where time truly realizes itself as time and where life seems to just leap forth from the depths of the world. In the words of Heraclitus, time is a child playing and making a move with a draughtsman, the play of the kingdom of a child. Or as Nietzsche writes in philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks, a coming to be and a passing away, a building up and tearing down without any moral glossing, an innocence that is forever equal. In this world, it belongs only to the play of artists and children. And as the child and the artist plays, so too plays the ever-living fire. It builds up and tears down in innocence. Such is the game that the eon plays with itself. This living fire is what animates and kindles the likeness within us. This living fire is in danger of getting extinguished by the total economic management of the earth. Now, let me read a passage from Heidegger's talk, The Mystery of the Bell Tower, which I translated sometime after the idleness seminar, where I think we can hear the glowing sound of this temporality that I tried to explain. The mysterious joint or fuge in which the liturgical holidays, the vigil days, the course of the seasons and the hours of morning, noon and evening of each day were joined together so that a ringing was constantly moving through the young hearts, dreams, prayers and games. It, the joint, is probably that which safeguards just one of the most miraculous and holiest and most perpetual mysteries of the tower, to bestow it ever changing and inimi inimitable into the Gebirg des Seins, the mountain range of being, until the last ringing. Or let us listen to Hakuin Ikaku, the founder of modern Rinzai Zen. Before all the kalpas, so that's world times, past and after the, all the kalpas to come. A marvelous spiritual light glints with austere chill in the sheath of a hair-splitting blade. A round gem shining in dark night is brought forth on its tree. Then Hakuin adds, Yesterday at dawn I swept the suit of the old year away. Tonight I grind and knead flour for the new year's sweets. There is a pine tree with its roots and an orange with its leaves. Then I don new clothes and await the coming guests. One minute. These examples... Daniel. Daniel, one minute. Thank you. I'm, I'm almost finished. <laughs> In these examples, time is still appreciated as a gift. 
We can also hear the ringing of the mysterious joint Heidegger talked about. We breathe the fresh air of a space time where boredom is wholly absent and where a perpetual play of the like occurs. The aspect shift from the privative nihility towards the superlative emptiness is just that. Things are not scattered apart and flowing aimlessly in the soup of nihility. No, everything is joined together mysteriously without a why and things leap forth with a true likeness from out of which they self-standingly arise. The rose is on warum sie blühet, weil sie blühet. The rose is without a why, she blossoms because she blossoms, says Angelus Silesius, the German poet and mystic from the Baroque era. The dizzying, decentering of the privative nothing that has been unleashed by our tearing up of the infinite horizon is transformed and gathered into concentrated play within the home ground of the present, within the world time of the eternal recurrence in which time becomes whole again. The no thinging horror of boredom becomes the play of the innocent becoming of the worlding world. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Herr Zaroba, almost like Zaratustra. That spoke Saruma. Well, that sounded like Saruman. <laughs> <laughs> well, like the, the Tsar, the Tsar in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> and now we, yeah. And now it's Leonard's turn. Let's see if you can replicate the heart of your abstract in your talk. Yeah, let's see. Okay, I also start and I have to make a timer so I will cut off when it's like over 10 minutes. So um, I, I just... Um, make the outline for what I um, want you to, to, then I also wrote, wrote more about, so if you're interested then you can read it, of course. And it's about um, the poetry, um, tremolus um, and fingernails. Um, okay. And it's more of an erratic take. So suffer, be afraid, think. To start with this quote from Terra in Transe, World in Trance, also called Land in Anguish, Earth in Trance by Glauber Rocha. The events of Terra in Transe takes place in the imaginary state of El Dorado. The protagonist, protagonist and narrator Paolo Martins, as his life ebbs away, he's actually deadly wounded by the police. He recalls the events which led to his personal and political defeat. Four years earlier, he had been the poet protégé of the writer Porifolio Diaz before leaving him in order to explore a more po political kind of poetry. Paolo timidly expresses a desire to speak of politics in a new kind of poetry. The subsequent events of the film, however, show the precise political limits within which poetry and art may generally operate. It becomes obvious that Vieira prefers his political poets to be safely buried in the past. In a shot whose backlighting and rectangular composition may somewhat recall Jean-Luc Godard, we see Paolo aim his camera out of his apartment window and take a photograph, while his off-screen voice comments, I, for example, devote myself to the vain exercise of poetry. The vain exercise of poetry. So in this movie, we deal with the alliances somehow, warpings, condemnations, confusions, bewilderments of poetry and politics. And now we come to Nietzsche and I cite um, Alex McIntyre. Through his vision of grand politics, Nietzsche offers us a poetry of the future that attempts to imaginatively develop fortdichten, a higher image of being human, an image of a great and beautiful soul. Moreover, because greatness for Nietzsche implies a soul that is loving and encompassing and spacious, it must take itself back into the innocence of becoming and embody a communion and joy that embraces and affirms what is coming to be in the past and present. In this sense, the great and beautiful soul personifies a joy in the actual and active, says Alex McIntyre. And McIntyre raises it all, right, for a Nietzschean poetry of the future, greatness, beauty, love, innocence, joy. Now, let us fed in some Nietzsche here about love, re rejoice, which we obviously did too, too little, he says, and beauty and art. What is love but understanding and rejoicing that another lives, works, and feels in a different and opposite way to ourselves? That love may be able to bridge over the contrasts. By joyce, we must not remove or deny those contrasts. If love is to bridge these antithesis, through joy it may not deny or seek to abolish them. Even self-love presupposes an unblendable duality or multiplicity in one person. 
human and human all too human. This whole book is nothing but a bit of merrymaking after long privation and powerlessness, the rejoicing of strength that is returning of a reawakened belief in a tomorrow and the day after tomorrow of a sudden sense of an anticipation of a future, of impending adventures, of seas that are open again, of goals that are permitted again, believed again, preface to the gay science. And the essence of all beautiful art, all great art is gratitude. I want to learn more and more to see as beautiful what is necessary in things. Then I shall be one of those who make things beautiful. Looking away shall be my only negation. So moreover, and this is David Dean in Nietzsche and Theology, he says, for Nietzsche, the beautiful in itself is not even a concept, merely a face. And reversing Schopenhauer, for whom the object orients and is mirrored by the subject, for Nietzsche, man really mirrors himself in things, that which gives him back his own reflection. He considers beautiful. Ultimately, for Nietzsche, aesthetics is a product of the will to power. It's man's deepest instinct that of self-preservation and self-aggrandizement is still visible in such sublimated forms. So I ask, doesn't beauty Nietzsche tones seems to be somewhat or only scarcely beautiful thing. We have to learn to see things as beautiful. Things give us back our own reflection that we consider beautiful in the first place. Far more, we, we seem somehow burdened with the task, maybe responsibility to make things beautiful. The artist, like the God of the creation, remains within or behind or beyond or above his handiwork, invisible. We find out of existence, indifferent, paring his fingernails. This is me quoting James Joyce in a portrait of the artist as a young man. And now cut another movie, Makunaima, 1969. He couldn't tell people from the machines and that Rowitan. In, in this movie, Makunaima by Mario de Andrade, mother bird Makunaima and he does not speak. So let's stick with this. Nietzsche does have a, an intriguing relation to language. He wants, uh, he wants to and must partake in a dialogue which is not yet his one, I would say. His voice breaks through and his thoughts diverse into obscure space of thinking. Tremulous, I will call it. And want to say with this, his voice does not have this tremulous, but this tremulous is what makes up his voice. Nietzsche Saratustra tells us, let us speak of, let us speak thereof, ye wisest ones, even though it be bad. And Nietzsche goes on, as Jung emphasizes, to be silent is worse. All suppressed truths become poisonous. This is talking cure, right? Zarathustra speaks. And also in Terra and Trance, the protagonist say, says, wearing my heart or soul on my sleeve, tongue, let's say tongue in German, it's tongue, the, the, the saying, and again, I sank into the depths of my senses, Paulo says. So one step further, tremulous, not as an oscillating sounding, but as an aphonia moment in speech, singular, not simply conserved. For if we want to draw nearness to the trembling it, and get closer to it, leap into it, so to say, make it come about for us, we need poetic language. So this is somehow for me the end of philosophy, something, something like that. So it's a fulcrum, a logical moment, unreachable, resistant, pre-logic, prehistoric in a way. And Nietzsche says, Learning transformed us, transforms us. It does that which all nourishment does, um, which does not merely preserve, as the physio physiologist knows, but at the bottom of us, right down deep, there is to be sure something unteachable, a granite stratum of spiritual fate, of predetermined decision and answer to predetermined selected questions. In the case of every cardinal problem, there speaks an unchangeable, this is I. So here we are on the task of education, and Timo Hoyer says on Nietzsche, the task of education is to provide the means by which the destiny carved in granite can be exposed or freed up, one could perhaps say. So, okay, non-discursive language, we note that. And, um, well, doesn't it kick in now that, that non-discursive language, this petrified in the form of a text, is insufficient for this task of education, given the contingent nature and genealogical origin of grammar. One, one could even say, sorry for the bad pun, the geological, like the stone and the, and the granite. Okay, so now cut again, fingernail reflections. In 1879, Nietzsche suffered by a septic inflammation under his fingernails, maybe by, from teaching because that caused him too much, too much stress in the time, one says. So now Deleuze um, concerning or questioned concerning his fingernails. He says, my fingernails, which are too long, 
which are long because I don't cut them. Well, wouldn't one's life be less painful if one's fingernails remain constantly and at an ideal state, asked Harry Osmus. One might say, and it's true, that I dream of being not invisible, but imperceptible. And the closest I can get to the dream is having fingernails I can keep in my pocket, says Deleuze. So with Nietzsche, we have looking away and with Deleuze, somewhat, somewhat this holding away or keeping away, as it seems. So Nietzsche's fingernails, this is Ida Overbeck, like he, uh, she was really um, contemporary um, of, of Nietzsche. Nietzsche's fingernails, he said after meeting Nietzsche, had a peculiar form. They were arched and sank at the points one thought of a high-flying bird up in the blue sky. Nietzsche's demeanor was amiable, could have even a trace of femininity. Okay, so, so this is, uh, she's speaking of, of Nietzsche's fingernails. And fingernails, right, they're not transparent and, and we cannot see through them and we can only, to a certain degree, get behind them and with, with somehow cruelty. And this is the self-mutilation um, aspect of, of fingernails, I would say, clipping fingernails, for example. Nietzsche also refers to at unguium, face of, the face of polishing in which the sculptor perfects the nails of the statue. And now last sentence. Um, ah, yeah, and, and um, last sentence. So, see, so Nietzsche also refers to uh, Lucian and, um, and they're, they're the fingernails and death are crucial for German gods, interestingly, because and the particu particu particular qualities of the ship that sails before the final battle Ragnarok in Lucian, the ship that is called Nagelfar also becomes loose. It is made of the nails of that man. So this was it. Marvelous, really good. <laughs> You're like a living library of cultural tropes and themes and it's incredible. Thank you very much. That's very good. Um, uh, sorry, I have to have to be strict to myself. Who's next? Um, Lou. One after the other today. I'm glad you mentioned a ship at the end. My talk is on Nietzsche the Pelagic, yeah, good. Nietzsche uh, Proteus, and really doing research, I found that Nietzsche is the superlative of his age, the late 19th century, which is still our age. Um, and how much the sea is a symbol of, of this time and, and the, the abyss of the sea. So I want to start by reading from a poet who I think is one of the greatest English poets whose life is exactly contemporaneous with Nietzsche. He was born in 1844 and he died in 1889 when Nietzsche you know, descended in, into his madness. Uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins. And I'm not gonna read the whole uh, thing, but the poem is called That Nature is a Heraclitean Fire, and I'll just read some parts of it. Man, how fast his fire dint, his mark on mind is gone. Both are in an unfathomable, all is in an enormous dark, drowned. Fall to the residuary worm, world's wire, wildfire, leave but ash, in a flash, at a trumpet crash. So my talk is called Nietzsche the Pelagic. Pelagic creatures get their name from the Greek word pelagos, which is a synonym for thalassos or sea. These creatures do not need to remain near the shores, near the sandbars or the reefs. They can swim directly out into the open. And I'd like to suggest to you, that's what Nietzsche does. If I can read a quote from the Gay Science where he writes, we have left the land and departed. Behind us, our bridges burn, and we have gone even further and burned the land behind us too. Look out, little ship, before you is the ocean. I also like to think about Nietzsche's constant talk of the weight and the, the heaviest burden. Not only would that would mean carrying, walking around, hiking up mountains with that burden, what would it mean to be swimming out in the open with heaviest burden? Nietzsche is ahead of us in the sense that he sees ahead of us, like a scout before a fleet of ships, or even like a prophet. And so the future he sees for his epoch, which is our epoch, is that we too are following him out to sea. Think of the quote where Nietzsche says, ever since Copernicus, man has been drifting out from the center into an unknown X. 
this ocean, this sea, is our freedom, but it is also an abyss, the often quoted uh, line from Nietzsche that you stare long enough into the abyss and it stares back into you. But I want to suggest another way in which Nietzsche is pelagic. In Homer's Odyssey, through Menelaus, we learn about the sea god and the sea prophet, Proteus. He's almost impossible to catch, to pin down, wrestle with him. He transforms into seals, into fish, into sharks, into whales. It's very hard to capture him, but the rewards are tremendous if you can. Proteus is a shapeshifter. He takes as many forms as the mysterious sea displays. That's been my experience these past weeks in rereading Nietzsche. I found him so hard to pin down and to pigeonhole into any positions or theses. So I want to talk about that. I also want to talk a little bit about how Nietzsche is the superlative of his age, how he's paradigmatic uh, of these many things. You know, one of the greatest novels of the 19th century is Moby Dick. It's about a crew chasing this mysterious creature out in the open. Gerard Manley Hopkins, who I mentioned before, almost an exact contemporary of Nietzsche, his most famous poem is called The Wreck of the Deutschland, which was a ship named Germany that was wrecked at sea. In 1871, when Nietzsche was in uh, Basel, and just before he used to publish The Birth of Tragedy, there was the Franco-Prussian War. In the aftermath of this war, in a battlefield littered with dead Prussian soldiers, the poet Rambeau walked around and felt that his age was coming to an end. Um, I imagine in some timeline, perhaps there's, there's a world where Nietzsche and Rambeau met on the battlefield, um, but it wasn't this one. Um, Rambeau's great uh, partner before he quit poetry, feeling that it was over, was uh, Verlaine. Verlaine is actually more famous than Rambeau, or more well-liked at least in, in France. And uh, so much so that his name has become a verb or, or a noun. In, in French slang, you can reverse a word. Instead of saying, c'est fou, it's crazy, you say, c'est ouf, you just reverse it. And one of Verlaine that I really like is this author, this German author, Mainona. You can guess the uh, Verlaine there. It's anonyme. That was his nom de plume, was anonyme, Mainona. And Mainona was a Kant scholar, but he also wrote one of the first biographies of Nietzsche. His teacher was a man named Ernst Marcus, who's a somewhat unknown neo-Kantian. But uh, Ernst Marcus uh, had fights about the value of Kant's philosophy, the value of German idealism, the legacy of philosophy, much as Nietzsche thought about this legacy. And he fought with a man named Eric Adikes. And Eric Adikes is more well known because he had a tremendous controversy with yet another thinker, philosopher, scholar named Haeckel. Not Hegel, the German philosopher, but Ernst Haeckel, who was the most famous biologist of the time. And although he's almost completely forgotten today, he was one of the best-selling authors of the late 19th century. And I have this book that's very aptly named, Art from the Abyss. Haeckel is very famous for sketching these beautiful uh, illustrations of creatures that were pulled from the HMS Challenger voyage that was looking to find life at the bottom of the ocean to see if life existed. And so while he was drawing these, these famous uh, Kunstformen, in the 1880s, Nietzsche was writing his most famous works. And uh, I would go into a longer discussion about biology and, and things like that. Um, but just to say that uh, one of Haeckel's last books he wrote was uh, trying to completely eliminate Kant from science. He wanted Kant to have no place in, in the way we, that science was conducted. However, the way that he understood art, and he studied art in Naples, um, was very Kantian in the way. He saw purpose and teleology in nature. So on, on the one hand, we have an affirmation of Kant and, and, the, and also a denial. And again, I, I think Nietzsche thought through these themes uh, in, a, in a very deep way. Um,
just uh, want to move ahead here to finish up. Um, so some of the ways in which I found my mind very much changed through reading Nietzsche is um, I just chose a few themes here. Um, for example, before the course, I classified Nietzsche as a vitalist, however you might take that theme, um, opposing monk-like asceticism and any emphasis on the afterlife. Um, but as I read more and more, I found it harder to pin him down as simply a vitalist. For example, if you take this quote from The Wanderer and His Shadow, where Nietzsche talks about how thinking of death can make life sweeter. The certainty of death could sweeten all lives with a precious and fragrant drop of lightheartedness. But all you strange pharmacist souls have soured it into a foul tasting drop of poison. And so to simply classify him as a vitalist, you know, everything that affirms life, uh, I found that, you know, again, he slips away in that respect. I classified him as an anti-Platonist, um, allowing, uh, allowing him this idea that Plato needs to be eradicated and that that is the legacy that must be uprooted from Western thinking to transvalue all values. However, I found thinking about some interesting parallels, for example, in their eternal recurrence, if Nietzsche is foretelling the Zukunft, the future that is to come, the future of nihilism for the Western man, if we think somewhat creatively in proximity to the eternal recurrence, his prophecy is also a kind of memory, a kind of recollection and amnesis that we might think about platonically. And lastly, um, I found Nietzsche's style, I was expecting him to be the, the apogee, say, of seriousness and heaviness. The subtitle of Twilight of the Idols is How to Philosophize with a Hammer. I have this book of Nietzsche quotations called Hammer of the Gods, the will to power, all these very things. But the more I read, I found he also emphasizes the lightest of touches. Uh, the Gay Science is the title of one of his books. Um, his discussion of classism and romanticism, the tension between the Apollonian and Dionysian, we see the, an emphasis on, on lightness and joy and uh some of his quotes there's one that i love um from genealogy of morality he says to be incapable of taking one's enemies one's accidents even one's misdeeds seriously for very long that is the sign of a strong full nature in whom there is an excess of power to form mold and recuperate and to forget the power of forgetting mirabeau who's a french revolutionary had met no memory for insults and vile actions done to him and he wasn't able to forgive because he had already forgotten. Such a man shakes off with a single shrug the many vermin that eat deep into others. And there you can find many quotes like this. And so I found that, uh, again, Nietzsche, just a very protean figure and hard to pin down. Um, in German, the abyss is abgrund. Is there a kind of ground in the abyss itself? Did Nietzsche attain this? And this explains how he was able to dwell in the open as a pelagic creature. If so, I would suggest that Nietzsche was in some sense pointing beyond even the abyss to a new kind of guiding ground, guiding origin that is perhaps higher than the abyss as a ruling principle. In Greek, we might say arche. Nietzsche found this, I venture, through an encounter with Greece. And remember, in Greek, we might translate ground or grund, conceived as ruling principle, as arche. Nietzsche sought this arche of the abyss, of the ocean, of the pelagos. And so we might name him the pelagic thinker seeking the archipelago. Is this archipelago Greece? Sometimes Nietzsche names the home that we are looking for as the world of Greece. And to just end, I'd like to read another Manly Hopkins poem called uh, in honor of the Halkion nature of Nietzsche's thinking in this guild. The poem is, uh, As Kingfishers Catch Fire. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. As tumbled over rim and roundy wells, stones ring, 
Like each tuck string tells, each hung bell's bow swung, finds tongue to fling out its broad name. Each mortal does one thing and the same. It deals out that being indoors where each one dwells. Selves goes itself, myself it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is for me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices keeps grace, that all his goings graces. And there, anyway. Thank you, Lou. So it's talk, but thank you for, <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much, Lou. Very good. Very broad. And you should definitely also keep writing on that. Um, and thank you also for the poem of the Halkion bird. Very appropriate. Um, James, Dr. Simkin. Well, soon to be Dr. Simkin. It shall be your turn. Right. I'm muting myself there. Okay, can you see me? Yeah, yes, yeah. sir. Okay, so my talk is entitled Negative Capability and Nihilism as Nietzsche's Artistic Leitmotif. <clears throat> In 1817, the romantic poet John Keats developed the idea of negative capability. The pursuit of an artistic project, even though it appears confused and contradictory, as opposed to the pursuit of logical certainty and rationalism. This paper will use the concept of negative capability to explore the possibility that for Nietzsche, far from being the obvious state of existence, nihilism perhaps became an act of faith for him the underpinning of his atheology upon which he built his positive vision of life as a work of art. In order to embellish this claim, the paper will then also draw on quotations from Burden of Dreams, the documentary covering Werner Herzog's filming of Fitzcarraldo, Deep in the Peruvian Rainforest, in order to show how Herzog's similarly nihilistic and chaotic view of the universe nonetheless leads him to produce great works of cinematography. In true Nietzschean style, therefore, the point of this essay is not to prove or disprove that Nietzsche is ultimately right or wrong about his claim that the universe is fundamentally meaningless and nihilistic, but to suggest that while the working assumption of a cold and indifferent universe can be a darkly fascinating muse upon which to build an artistic vision, as Nietzsche and latterly Herzog did, did our own personal phenomenological experience of being shining forth with spontaneous meaning show that more positive reactions to the underlying substrate of existence can be possible too. The first aim of this essay therefore is to show how Nietzsche's critique of truth itself actually opens the way for a more sympathetic interpretation of his claims to nihilism as the true nature of being. For Nietzsche, the empirical truth of a statement is perhaps the least important thing about it. Indeed, one of the tasks Nietzsche set himself in the genealogy of morality was to explode, quote, the will to truth, the flames hit, lit by the thousand year old faith, the Christian faith, which was also Plato's faith, that God is truth, that truth is divine. Instead, Nietzsche scholar Pietro Gori argues uh, Nietzsche held a certain utilitarianism about truth. As Nietzsche writes in Beyond Good and Evil, quote, the falseness of an opinion is not for us any objection to it. The question is, how far our opinion is life furthering, life, further, life preserving, species prever preserving, perhaps species rearing. In short, truth serves life. Using this framework, therefore, Nietzsche's claims to nihilistic certainty are relieved from their burden of the proof. Instead, coupling negative capability with Nietzsche's perspectivism allows Nietzsche's nihilism to be conceived of as an artistic leitmotif. His jumping off point for his artistic philosophical project without it actually having to be a statement of fact. In order to embellish this claim, it is, impossible, it is possible to see negative capability at work in the films of the famous Bavarian film director Werner Herzog, who, similarly to Nietzsche, also appears to underpin his work with a nihilistic outlook. In The, Burdens of, the Burden of Dreams, a documentary made about the making of Herzog's film 
motion picture, Fitzcarraldo, filmed deep in within the Proven Rainforest. Hertog holds forth on his feelings about the jungle in which they are surrounded. And I won't do the accent, but here's the quote. So, quote, taking a close look at what's around us, there is some sort of harmony. It is the harmony of overwhelming and collective murder. And we, in comparison to the articulate vileness and baseness and obscenity of all this jungle, we, in comparison to that enormous articulation, we only sound and look like badly pronounced and half-finished sentences out of a stupid suburban novel. And we have to become humble in front of this. Overwhelming misery and overwhelming fornication, Herzog continues. Overwhelming growth and overwhelming lack of order. Even the stars up here in the sky look like a mess. There is no harmony in the universe. End quote. As captivating as Herzog's wonderfully dark prose is here, one can't but help feel a smile cross one's face. It feels a little too performative, a little too contrived. Herzog and Nietzsche's nihilistic stance leads them to great artistic accomplishments in their respective fields, but it is an artistic stance nonetheless, rather than a statement of fact. So, just as Nietzsche and Herzog assert their nihilistic vision of existence, so too we may assert that a, a phenomenological reflection on our own daily experience of being seems to show us that, yes, we experience negative emotion, nihilistic moods, the 3 a.m. thoughts, the dark night of the soul, so to speak, but we also experience times of great positivity, where meaning seems to spontaneously shine forth from the activities we are engaged in. Nietzsche, of course, understood this. For him, music in particular was a great conduit of meaning. It must be cheerful and yet profound, like an October afternoon, he writes in Eki Homo. I'm coming to the conclusion now. Indeed, as Joshua informed me, in, in his book, Anti Nietzsche, Malcolm Bull writes about how, quote, the collapse or eradication of value in one sphere simply leads to its re-emergence elsewhere, end quote. Perhaps eventually, Nietzsche, the great destroyer of, of idols, himself became too dogmatic. As John Gray states in The Soul of the Marionette, quote, the most radical modern critic of religion, Nietzsche lamented modern monotheisms, monotheisms formative influence while exhibiting its influence himself. The absurd figure of the Ubermensch embodies the fantasy that history can be given meaning by the force of human will. Aiming in his early work to restore the sense of tragedy, Nietzsche ended up promoting yet another version of the modern project of human self-assertion. Thus, far from the universe being a valueless void, it seems that like in a game of metaphysical whack-a-mole, value keeps re-emerging all over the place, not least in the act of valuation itself. To conclude, perhaps the ultimate critique of Nietzsche's nihilistic vision might therefore be that far from the universe being void of meaning, maybe it is too full of meaning. Thank you. Very good, James. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I was always very amazed by all your papers and will we'll try and publish them again. By the way, I sent off the uh, Heidegger papers to Steve this week. So that should come up at some point. So Joshua, you were just quoted. And now it's your turn, Professor Hansen. Excellent. Uh, many thanks, Johannes. Uh, and I think it's very apropos. This kind of goes right in line with what James was talking about. Uh, so my presentation's entitled Nietzsche's Republic, the Elevation of Art Over Morality and Its Implications. And so the title referencing is referencing Nietzsche's turning of Plato on his head. My philosophy is an inverted Platonism. He wrote in a fragment from 1870 to 71. And so while Plato began from the good to which arete or virtue cohered in the birth of tragedy, Nietzsche famously proclaims that only as an aesthetic phenomenon are existence in the world eternally justified. And despite distancing himself from a certain romanticism and taking the more analytical turn of his middle period, for instance, human all to human, 
Nietzsche never fully recanted, writing in Will to Power, for us, only the aesthetic judgment is law and many other quotations. So for Nietzsche, aesthetics arise from the art impulses of nature. Uh, for instance, dreams and intoxications, which come to represent his Apollonian and Dionysian. Here's a quote, uh, man lets his dreams lie to him at night his whole life long, his moral sense never trying to prevent it. Uh, because Nietzsche pushed Kant to the absolute limit, the Apollonian or dream state illusion becomes tantamount to everyday life in some sense. Uh, a riff of Johannes from the lecture where he says, the presupposition of all thought is the lie. And so if truth for Nietzsche is the irresolvable tragedy at the heart of existence, Socrates and Plato have suppressed that truth by overshadowing the tragic poets and bringing in an epoch of Socratic moralism to Nietzsche's mind, a denial of life. Nietzsche notes that Plato had to burn his poems to follow Socrates, who thought that philosophy was preparation for death. For Nietzsche, art is mightier than knowledge, for it wants life, and knowledge attains as its ultimate end only annihilation. So key to the restoration of tragic existence would be the destruction of both Socratic and Christian morality. Nietzsche calls morality the danger par excellence in genealogy of morals. He asserts that morality is life's negative instinct and claims we have to destroy it to liberate life. Hence why Nietzsche wants to turn Plato on his head. Plato, real name Aristocles, is often said to have been called Plato due to having broad shoulders cultivated from no doubt his testosterone-fueled wrestling or what have you. Yet according to Philodemus's History of the Academy, Plato's parents gave him the nickname due to having a massively broad forehead, uh, so big that it actually once gave him away while in disguise. And so by dint of this monumental forehead, if nothing else, perhaps Plato can survive Nietzsche's inversion. We should recall that Nietzsche lavishes extremely rare praise on Plato, calling him the most powerful philosopher we've yet seen in Beyond Good and Evil. So no question, we now live in a Nietzschean age. Nietzsche may be now the most name-dropped philosopher of all time, paradoxical considering that his works were written for the few, require understanding the history of philosophy, including Kant, and are offered with the caveat that few will or can understand. It's unlikely that even Nietzsche would approve of his immense pop cultural cachet, uh, as his works were carefully and intricately limited by Nietzsche himself. And so rather than asking who has, the question might be which pop cultural celebrity hasn't quoted Nietzsche. And so while Nietzsche famously asserted that Christianity is Platonism for the people, the Nietzsche of popular culture has all too often come to mean neoliberalism for narcissists. I'm claiming that this connects to Nietzsche's own value clarification, and so be committing what has been called the last heresy, which is basically saying anything that fails to simp Nietzsche. And so, of course, even amplifying Nietzsche is no easy task itself doing due to the labyrinthine twists found across his oeuvre. As Andre Comte de Sponville puts it, it is anti-Nietzschean to think that one knows uh, what Nietzsche really thought. And that, of course, makes him irrefutable and irrefutable any interpretation we may wish to make of him. End of quote from Spanvi. So that's one claim I'll make is some of Nietzsche's interventions, when severed from his overall value ecology, result in the problem of runaway avant-gardism. And I'm going to discuss that first within the realm of art. So in Derrida's essay, Structure, Sign, and Play, he writes the notion of rupture and references the decentering of the transcendental signified. Here's a quote from Derrida. I would probably cite the Nietzschean critique of metaphysics, the, cr the critique of the concepts of being and truth for which were substituted, the concepts of play, interpretation, interpretation, and sign, sign without truth present. And Derrida also, he names Freud and Heidegger as co-defendants. So in art after metaphysics, John David Evert notes that being was fixed in transcendental signifieds prior to the deconstruction of the grand meta narratives, and art was correspondingly 
anchored in religious iconotypes, the saints and so forth, uh, prior to Nietzsche's enunciation of the collective murder of God. In parallel, we also see the retinal shift that was initiated by Marcel Duchamp after World War I, where art is no longer to please the eye, but to serve the mind. And then this staked out a path for contemporary artists like Damien Hirst. Shortly after World War II, uh, we have Mark, Mark Rothko is, is painting rectangles, basically coffins for Ebert, which are depicting a near complete recess of meaning, a void depicting the alleged total collapse of metaphysics. And it's into this void that the abstract expressionists, uh, you know, begin literally throwing paint, depicting the semiotic vacancies at the heart of being in Ebert's language. Warhol then goes on to replace these religious iconotypes with the new tokens of economic optimism, i.e. mechanically reproduced consumer goods, and then icons culled from the ever-expanding cult of celebrity. I personally draw the line at Duchamp's fountain, an inverted urinal offered for exhibition in New York in 1917, which was basically the centering of a human waste receptacle, posing the question, you know, to aesthetics. And so while Plato could basically call this immoderate or inharmonious, lacking soundness of mind, uh, you know, or even courage understood as wise perseverance, um, you know, based on his conception of arete, the question is, what of Nietzsche? So this may be moralizing, you know, categorizing this as a sort of provocation rather than art, but Nietzsche happens to only do his moralizing ex negativo. The constant Dionysian undercutting of Nietzsche sets off a spiral that permits increasingly ornate justifications for supposed life improperly understood. And so not that Nietzsche would necessarily agree with this, but he does provide resources for provocateurs by stating that a penchant for questionable and terrible things is a symbol of strength in will to power. And he expresses the desire to, quote, bring to light the falseness of art, its immorality. And this has certain ontological implications for Nietzsche, no question. Uh, all the same, if life to core is to be affirmed by the transfiguration of urine, I claim that the aesthetic justification for life had to fail. And so obviously this is in the art world. There are far more serious you know, threats facing the political and economic sphere. So I'm gonna turn to uh, what was discussed in the course and drawing from Justin Murphy's interview with Nick Land on ideology, intelligence and capital. Uh, we could think of structures such as the church, the state, at a certain point in time, the academy as capital containment mechanisms that previously held back explosions of capital, whereas now almost all critical institutions are on track for total capital autonomization. Um, here's a quote from Land, deregulation and the state arms race each other, each other into cyberspace. That's how we put it in the particularly brilliant essay, Meltdown. But as someone with reservations about accelerating, I'd claim that Nietzsche's attempted overcoming of morality has been misused by false spirits to degrade art, per permit the rise of bourgeois philistinism, and to undermine morality's capital containment properties with particularly horrifying results. We have the critique or deconstruction of almost everything as the almost centering fact as post-structuralism calcifies into an epoch of discursive normativity, basically not a new what for, but a new whatever you want, coupled with Nietzsche's Copernican revolution in self-praise. As Peter Slaughterdyke recounts for much of history, people tried to place themselves closely to the objects of eulogy or praise, for instance, you know, by praising the team that you are a part of. Nietzsche turns this on his head too by making himself the object of extolment. We also see a bourgeois re revolt in morality, the abandonment of noblesse oblige for a sort of academicism, obligation in letter alone, but not in spirit. And what matters now is the valuation of what matters most, not what actually matters. 
as corporate nihilism brings on ecological destruction, social atomization, the relentless drive of total economic management, and as we all wait for the final detonation of that bomb called science, I'd argue that all of the above cut against life properly understood, theorized from anywhere, and that the status of the moral hypothesis today, therefore, may be that the overcoming of morality sought out ac across the birth of tragedy, beyond good and evil, twilight of the idols, will to power, etc., at least taken a la carte, is exposed as life-diminishing empirically, suggesting Dionysian explosions and recurrences of a suppressed antiquarian concept we thought we'd passed, which would be bad. What if the last man is not Fukuyama's but Spengler's, the Roman soldier at Pompeii who stated his post because he wasn't properly relieved? There seems to be a catharsis and tragic affirmation there as well, exhibiting something that perhaps even Nietzsche would affirm, uh, a nobility not found in the dancing of Steven Pinker or his followers who'll have to refute themselves in order to board the last shuttles. If art as tragic existence might be seen to exhibit equi primordiality and simultaneity with morals, then that would be the reputation of Nietzsche. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, great to see everybody. Very much enjoyed the course. Cheers. Thank you, Professor Hansen. I think that was your best one so far, and I've heard many of you. I, yes, everyone's applauding. I'm applauding for real. That was very good. Thank you. I look forward to reading that also. It's one of the things I'm thinking is I will have to finish the book at some point, and we'll probably quote a couple of you then. Um, so thanks very much. Now, Nick, you have the honor to okay. finalize it all. You're the, uh, that's a lot of pressure. not the last man. You're the, the <laughs> ultimate. That's different. Okay, Nick, go ahead. Yeah. Um, my talk is to serve a riff on just sort of thoughts I've been having throughout the course. It's a riff on sort of nihilism, Nietzsche, and sort of, I'm an aspiring fiction writer, so it's a riff on narrative a lot. And me being the token accelerationist, I think I'm going to be pushing back against Joshua's talk a little bit. But so let's get to it. Nihilism is nothing but too much time. When people without enough to do begin to look for something, that's when the problems start. This quote is from Nick Land's horror story, Chasm, and it frames the problem of nihilism as a problem of time. The problem of meaning only emerges when one lacks something to do, when nothing grabs oneself, and one lacks something to kill time. This is the pro precisely the problem the characters in Chasm face. The story is not one of any pressing needs on the characters, but one of a lack, a lack of anything to kill time, and are thus forced to grapple with the problem of meaning, a problem that eventually leads to dark thoughts coming to the surface and ultimately murder and violence in response to these dark revelations. The characters simply had too much time. So in the following talk, I use Nick Land's framing of nihilism as too much time in order to argue that nihilism, nihilism is precisely a problem of narrative for narrative traditionally acts as a call to action to fill our time in a certain way. However, Nietzsche complicates this notion of narrative as a simple call to fill our time in a certain way with his concept of the eternal recurrence of the like. This thought complicates our notion of time by making it nonlinear and thus asks us to come up with new narratives to confront this new notion of time. To that regard, I'll draw upon the film Arrival to give an example of what these new narratives might look like and throw for what meeting making might look like in the face of the eternal recurrence. Okay, so all narratives act as a means to fill time. A very simplistic view of narrative that you might have learned in English class or something is that it's a call to action that eventually comes to fruition and a claim acting therefore concludes. So when looked at in this way, all narratives act as a compression of time. It's a call to action to orient yourself towards a future goal or a resolution of a conflict in the future. In this way, narratives acts as a bulwark against nihilism. It demands one to kill time now in order to achieve something in the future, thereby answering 
Nietzsche's famous definition of nihilism as there is no why. Narratives answer the question of why by answering that, the, that it's for the sake of some future goal and therefore killing time. The problem laid out by Nietzsche is that we now lack any given or ingrained narratives in which we can orient ourselves in time and therefore, and therefore provide this time with meaning. After the death of God and the death of the Christian moral hypothesis, we are thrown into a role without any inherent demands in our, on our time, without any, broadly speaking, better future state to strive towards. The human race, it seems, face the same problem as the characters in Chasm, the problem of too much time and no demands on how to fill it. Now, the simple reading of Nietzsche would just say that the solution to this problem is through creating and affirming our own projects and narratives as sort of like our own will to power. And this is like a way to fill our time and solve the problem of meaning. But I would like to complicate this picture by throwing in Nietzsche's eternal recurrence of the like into the equation. The eternal recurrence is not some simple thought experiment, as Heidegger points out, but the key to an entirely new metaphysical understanding of time. Nietzsche asks us to imagine an infinite expanse of time where inevitably every combination of matter and energy are reproduced infinitely across this infinite expanse of time. This is the view of the universe Nietzsche asks us to take seriously, because this is the view, view of the universe that happens after the death of God, and this is the universe that we live in. So how are we supposed to find meaning within this universe? Again, this is a question of narrative. How do we affirm narrative when every future that can happen will happen already and infinitely? It would seem that all struggle in light of this thought would be re rendered meaningless for every future that can come to pass will come to pass, rendering them all meaningless. How do we create narratives in this light of this awareness? And just like from a writer's perspective, it would seem that this thought kills any attempt to create engaging narratives since the eternal recurrence destroys any possibility of a final end that has been achieved through the struggle of, of these characters. So all ends would not be the result of the struggles and choices of the characters, but only an inevitable outcome of the eternal recurrence. Likewise, why should you get invested in struggle through life knowing that every possible outcome will be repeated for all of infinity. In short, the problem Nietzsche lays out in this is the problem of why and get, get invested in anything given the knowledge of the eternal return. In answer to this question, I would like to draw upon the film Arrival, which deals with the problem of the eternal return. From the outset, Arrival explicitly states that this film will be de dealing with the problem of time. When then the main character, Louise Banks, declares that she no longer believes in beginnings and endings, an obvious solution to the nonlinearity of time that the eternal recurrence gets at. The movie involves Louise learning an alien language, as you all know. The aliens come down, she learns the language, and this allows her to like see time nonlinearly, so she can remember the future as she does this, as the past. And this reveals that the child that we believe was in her past was actually in her future and that this child is going to die prematurely from a mysterious illness. So the dramatic tension in this film comes from Louise accepting her, this tragic fate of hers. So against more traditional narrative. Yeah. So this is, this is the struggle of amor fati, or the love of fate, that Nietzsche says. This, this is the struggle of learning to love your fate, even if it's tragic, even if it's painful, as well as pleasurable and beautiful. So very briefly, I would just like to say that narrative after the eternal return would have to be one where we, A, we know the future, but also one where it's not a matter of struggling to create a new future, but one of struggling to accept the future that's been given to us. That's where the dramatic tension in these new narratives will come from. And also, I believe this is sort of the struggle of our own lives and how we give our own lives meaning. It's not through, it's not through trying to create a better world, but trying to accept the world that we've been given. 
So yeah, that's pretty much my talk. Very short, but yeah. Very good. Thank you. Really good. Also the point on how to take the eternal recurrence seriously, especially as a writer. Um, so please let us know whenever you've written something you're happy to share. <laughs>